Um, it's helpful, you know, uh, to have uh, someone like uh, Quinn With sitting us. behind you sometimes. I was, I was looking at my, uh, my microphone and I kept pushing the on button and it wouldn't come on. I was thinking, what is going on here? And then all of a sudden I see Quinn's hand kind of point at the battery that was sitting on the pew here. Apparently you need two of those things for this thing to work. Um, but uh, it's good to see you um, this evening. Uh, you know, as a, as a minister and as a preacher, throughout the week, the sermons that you craft and the lessons that you want to teach are determined by a variety of different things depending on the, the week. And sometimes, as on Sunday morning, it's determined by the text. If you're going through a particular text, you kind of just kind of teach through the text. At other times, it might be determined by a trend that you see that you feel needs to be discussed or maybe a topic needs to be discussed. And other times it comes from interactions that you have with members during the week and you realize that maybe there's a lesson or a need for a lesson that needs to be taught on. And so there's a variety of different things that come up during the week that kind of help to craft that lesson. Well, there were two articles that I read this past week that kind of helped to determine what we're going to talk about this evening. Two articles that I was actually troubled by, and I think you'll see why in a moment. Um, that the first article that I read was from Bloomberg News, and the headline simply said this. It says, America's drinking problem is much worse this century. That was the headline. And as I read through the article, it said, started off by saying that Americans are drinking more than they used to. Speaking, of course, of alcohol. A troubling trend with potentially dire implications for the country's future health care cost. Now, all of this was based upon a study that was released this last week. It probably just kind of flew under the radar for many of you. But JAMA Psychiatry published a study this past Wednesday. And the study found that the number of adults who engage in what's referred to as binge drinking, which is consuming enormous amounts of, of alcohol um, and exceeding much of the legal limit, um, the number of adults who binge drink at least once a week could be as high as 30 million. Now that is greater than the population of every state save California. 30 million individuals. David Jernigan, who is the director of the Center on Alcohol Marketing and Youth at John Hopkins School of Public Health, said this in the article. He said, this should be a wake-up call. Now notice what he says here. He says, alcohol is our number one drug problem. And it's not just a problem among kids. Now this is... This, this deeply concerned me when I read through this article, and I found another one that discussed this study as well uh, for a variety of issues, and, and for, for a variety of reasons. And it's a personal issue, I think, that hits close to home in our area because of the prevalence of distilleries and, and alcohol in our area. But I want you to notice that it refers to alcohol as a drug. And there's a reason that it's called intoxication. There's a reason for that. Because as we'll notice a little bit later, it is, it's toxic. The second headline that I saw that troubled me, or rather gave somewhat hope, but troubling as well, and the headline was this. It said, teenagers are less likely to drink if their parents disapprove. So I read that article, and it gave somewhat hope, because what, the, what it says is uh, Jacqueline Bowden, who's from the University of Adelaide, said this. She said, parents have more influence on their teenagers' decisions regarding alcohol than they probably realize. Parental behavior and attitudes toward alcohol really do make a difference and can help prevent children from drinking at an early age. Now, of course, ultimately, we realize that children make their own decisions, and ultimately, uh, they are free will beings, so they are going to make choices that ultimately can, when it gets down to it, the buck stops with them. But I think that out of both of these articles, I get two things from these articles. Number one is that there is a dangerous trend in alcohol consumption in our country. And the second thing that I got from both of these articles was that I can do something about that. <laughs> 
that I can do something to change the next generation as far as my family is concerned. And because of this, I thought it would be appropriate for us this evening to discuss the subject of, of alcohol. And, and surprisingly, there are some, especially in my generation, who are surprised to learn that Scripture has anything to actually say about this subject. I'm surprised to learn that it has anything to say at all about it. And it's not, I realize that this is not an easy issue to discuss. It's not one that I discuss or talk about lightly. I've wrestled with the subject for years and people in my family, close relatives of mine, are alcoholics. And so this hits very close to home for me. It's a very personal issue. And so as I wrestled with how to discuss this with you this evening, and I was thinking about in view of these two headlines, I thought we would discuss it from the standpoint of if my child came to me and asked me, why, Dad, why do you abstain from drinking? Why do you abstain from alcohol? What would be the reasons I would give my child as to why I abstain from alcohol? So tonight I want us to just look at four reasons as to why I abstain from alcohol and I encourage others to abstain as well. The first one being, I abstain because of the Bible's condemnation of drunkenness. The Bible's condemnation of drunkenness. Scripture's earliest recording of, of alcohol consumption, from what I can see, is, interestingly enough, in reference to uh, one of the Bible's great heroes, and that is Noah. In Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, he plants a vineyard and he gets, he gets drunk. And a very shameful act occurs with his son. We don't really know what happens, but something very shameful in which his son exposes his nakedness and takes advantage of his drunkenness. And from that point forward, the Bible pretty consistently condemns drunkenness. For example, after Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10 are consumed by God, Moses commands uh, or rather, God commands Moses to go to Aaron, and he tells Aaron that when the priests come before the Lord, he says there in Leviticus 10, verses 8 through 10, that they can consume no wine. They can consume no alcohol. He said, so that you can discern between right and wrong, between unclean and clean. And I find that encounter particularly interesting because it shows a couple of things. That is that when God was being approached in a very intimate way, He did not want whoever was approaching Him to be impaired in any way by alcohol. But what it also shows us is that Nadab and Abihu were probably drunk when they went in and offered strange fire to the Lord. That's my opinion. I think that's implied by the text. That's kind of something we skip over. We kind of think, well, just Nadab and Abihu went in there and they just didn't want to listen to the Lord. No, I, th I think most likely they were inebriated. And that's why Moses comes and has to command this of them. And I also think that it shows us alcohol's potential effects. And that is lack of discernment, as Moses puts it, between clean and unclean, between good and evil, and lack of restraint, which eventually led to the death of Nadab and Abihu. As we progress into the New Testament, of course, the New Testament con continues this condemnation of drunkenness. For example, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 21, there Paul says that drunkenness is a work of the flesh. In Romans 13 and verse 13, he condemns it as well. It's 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3. Peter, interestingly enough, not only condemns drunkenness, but he also condemns what he refers to as drinking parties, which were occasions in which individuals would get together just for the purposes of getting drunk. And sometimes that would be tied into idolatry as well. They would get drunk in honor of that, that deity. And so you might think of uh, you know, college parties where kids are just getting together simply for the purposes of, of getting drunk. So Peter condemns that as well in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3. But there's a very strong statement, a very strong condemnation, probably one of the strongest concerning drunkenness in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 21, where there Paul says that these individuals, drunkards and drunkenness, those who partake of drunkenness, he says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I, that, that is very strong language. And it's, it's within the list of a variety of other sins that he says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, 
But I don't want to flirt with anything that is going to keep me out of the kingdom of God. Uh, just as like, I, I, I don't want to flirt with fornication or adultery. See, a lot of times we like to get as close to the line as we possibly can with sin without actually crossing the line, right? And, and a lot of times we kind of justify it in that way. But we don't, we, we don't feel comfortable doing that with certain sins. For example, uh, just before I say this, this is an example. This is a hypothetical thing. This does not actually happen. But for example, imagine if I went out on a lunch date with another woman and I took her to lunch and um, we visited together. I brought her roses and I spent time with her and afterwards I text her and talked with her and had a special relationship with her. Maybe even gave her a kiss on the cheek before she left. Now technically, I have not committed adultery. Technically, I have not committed fornication by the letter of the law. But I'm not going to do that. In fact, you would tell me, if you saw me doing that, at least I hope you would tell me, that is inappropriate. That's not something that you should be doing. You're, you're flirting with that. I come back and say, well, you, I'm not technically doing anything wrong, right? But I'm not going to flirt with something that potentially is going to keep me out of the kingdom of heaven. There's also, I think, a couple of considerations that we need to make when looking at this issue. And that being that there have been historical changes surrounding alcohol since biblical times. Three historical changes in particular. Number one is distillation. The process of distillation, of course, was not possible back in biblical times. And being able to distill alcoholic beverages allows for a greater alcohol concentration than we've ever experienced in history before. The second one being proliferation. Meaning that greater amounts of alcohol with larger concentrations of alcohol are more available than they ever have been in history. Which leads to the third change, historical change, which is accessibility. There are Alcohol is more accessible and cheaper than it ever has been. And I was reading that in one of the articles that I was reading in preparation for this. One of the studies showed that alcohol is more, more accessible than it's ever been in American history and cheaper than it's ever been. Typically speaking, alcohol, especially during biblical times, was confined to the elite, especially the stronger alcoholic beverages. They were the only ones that could partake or, or, or at least get larger amounts of alcohol. In fact, uh, uh, some studies have shown that women, children, and slaves were not allowed to have alcohol. Okay? So there is less ac accessibility in biblical times than there are now. So what this means is that it is easier to get drunk faster than ever before. And studies show that the more that you drink, the more that you want to drink. Because alcohol has, again, takes away the, the previous restraint that you might have. So the more that you drink, the more that you want to drink. Have you noticed the billboards? I've, I've, I haven't seen as much as I used to, but there were billboards that, was, that were going around that said, uh, buzz driving is drunk driving. Have y'all have y'all seen that? I thought that was an interesting campaign. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Because what you have is individuals who think they've only had a few drinks and they can get behind a car and operate it effectively. I'm, I'm sure that you can talk to Tracy about that and he can tell you plenty of stories. Or Daryl, I'm sure there's plenty of stories that they have uh, about that. Individuals who think when they get into the car that they're not drunk. They've only had a few drinks, but then they get in, a, in, a, in an accident and hurt someone, whatever it might be. And what, what this shows us is that even the state, even the world recognizes that alcohol can influence and impair our ability to think rationally far easier than we may assume. We like to think we're stronger than we are. And so alcohol influences us to a greater extent and far easier than we might assume. So I, I abstain personally because of the Bible's condemnation of drunkenness. Secondly, because of the Bible's emphasis on sobriety. The Bible's emphasis on sobriety. Not only does the scripture condemn drunkenness, but it consistently and constantly encourages sober living. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, he says, prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded. He says in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober and vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion. Now that word sober isn't only in reference to drugs or alcohol, 
but it has the idea of living a life of clear, level, rational thinking. And so as a Christian, he encourages sober living because you're not simply living for the moment anymore. You're having to watch out for other things as well. You're having to avoid temptation. You're having to fight off sin. And because of that, he said that requires clear, rational thinking. There's a big contrast in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6 or 8 that Paul makes between, he says, those who get drunk, he says, get drunk in the night. But we are no longer of the night, he says, we are of the day. And then he encourages sober living. So there's kind of a, a contrast there that he makes in 1 Thessalonians uh, 5 or 6 or 8. Alcohol, I, I'm going to state kind of a, a, a truth that is self-evident here, but alcohol has an inherent unsobering effect. Right? I mean, that's why you're drinking it, is to, in some way, not be as sober as you were. Right? There's an automatic, inherent, unsobering effect. It causes impairment of rational thought, of motor abilities, of lack of restraint. I don't know about you, but I don't need any help being more dumb and irrational than I already am. Okay? I, I don't need any amens on that. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I want to constantly be on guard against temptation and against sin. I need to be clear-headed in my thinking when I'm facing my, my demons, if you will. In Shakespeare's play, in Shakespeare's play, Othello, um, he, Othello, the character Othello, at one point, in reference to alcohol, says, "Why would I put a thief in my mouth to steal my brains? Why would I put a thief in my mouth to steal my brains?" I like that line. There was another article that I was reading about a 23-year-old girl who was a recovering alcoholic. Now you can do the math on this. She had been sober for five years. She was 23 years old, and she was dr a drunk, a, 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 a drunk by 16. Okay, Th this is this is her killing our kids. I mean, it's killing, them. literally, not metaph literally killing. Them. Okay, and she she had been sober for five years, and when it was, it just hit me all of a sudden when I was reading this article and about her recovery, that when she said. I have been sober for five years, she didn't have to explain to me what she meant by that. I knew what she meant by that. It meant that she hadn't had a drink in five years. And she knew that she couldn't go back to that because she knew if she did that it would lead back to that lifestyle. I have a friend of mine who's a recovering alcoholic and he doesn't, he doesn't take a drink anymore because he realizes that it has an unsobering effect in his life. And so if we want to live that sober life, that's why... I abstain from alcohol and other drugs. And I say other drugs because as uh, the man mentioned, I, I have no idea if he's biblically principled. I, I don't think that he is, but m the state representative referred to it as a drug, and it is a drug. Thirdly, uh, the reason I abstain is because the Bible's warnings against the dangers of alcohol. The Bible's warning, the biblical warnings against the dangers of alcohol. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, Paul said, Test all things and cling to what is good. That is, weigh things out, test things, and cling to what is good. Now, just as a side note, what that means is, is that as a Christian, you have to be able to think discerningly. The Bible is not always going to lay things out for you step by step. It's not going to say, okay, do this, but don't do that. So it does that with certain things. But at other times, Paul constantly is stressing you need to be discerning. Test these things by the principles of Scripture and figure out what is good and cling to that. And the next verse, in verse 22, he said, but abstain from every form of evil. If it's good, cling to it. If it's evil, reject it. And friends, there is so much that is not good about alcohol. There's so much that is not good about it. From 2000, just listen to these statistics. From 2006 to 2010, that's four years, okay? From 2006 to 2010, excess drinking resulted in the death of 88,000 people per year. 88,000 per year in America. That's just in America. Over a span of four years, that's 352,000 people that have alcohol-related deaths. In a span of four years. That's, and, and what that is, what that comes down to is that is more than twice the number of deaths from prescription opioids and heroin. Okay? Now, what's telling to me is that we have state agencies 
and, and things that are, that are fighting against uh, prescription drug addictions and, uh, and heroin addictions and, and, and all these other drug addictions, but yet no one is really saying anything about the problem of alcohol in our society. I, I, I think that's troubling. That, that's twice the amount of deaths from prescription opioids and heroin. The estimated health costs, we all, you know, we're talking about health costs, a big thing. In our country. The estimated health costs per year in America for alcohol consumption is $250 billion. $250 billion per year are spent on health costs for alcohol consumption. The CDC put this uh, study out. Uh, it said alcohol is associated with most crime. It's involved in 70% of all murders, 41% of assaults, 50% of rapes, 60% of sex crimes against children, 56% of fights and assaults in homes, 37% of suicides, and 55% of all arrests. Further, alcohol is a safety hazard. It is involved in 66% of fatal accidents, 53% of fire deaths, 36% of pedestrian accidents, 22% of home accidents, and 45% of drowning. 50% of all traffic accidents are due to alcohol, killing 25,000 and seriously injuring 1 million annually. And it is the number one killer of people 25 and under, the number three killer in America for all ages. Now, here's another study that maybe many of you haven't heard of. And that is in 2014, the World Health Organization stated after an extensive study that there is no amount of alcohol that is safe when it comes to cancer risk. You might not know about that, but more and more, they, actually there is no longer a doubt that alcohol is a, a carcinogen. In 1988, in fact, the International Agency, International Agency for Research on Cancer declared alcohol a cancer-causing agent, a carcinogen. Seven deadly cancers have been linked to moderate, not excessive, but moderate alcohol consumption including liver, colon, and breast cancer, have all been linked to moderate alcohol consumption. So you're not hearing about this. These are things that are kind of flying under the radar that many people don't know about. But we are literally, as a country, drinking ourselves to death. We are, we, we are drinking ourselves to death. And hardly anyone is saying anything about it. But the Bible, of course, does warn against the dangers of being led astray by alcohol. The Proverbs writer says in Proverbs 20 and verse 1 that... Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and those who are led astray by it are not wise. It warns just a couple of chapters later in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 and following, of those who are led astray by, by alcohol. And Jesus said that you shall know a tree by its fruit. And I think that what these studies show us and our own experience shows us is that the fruit of alcohol is rotten. Fourthly and finally, I have seen because of the Bible's command to love. The Bible's command to love. Many times the debate about alcohol comes down to rights. Well, this is my right. I have a right to do this. But even if you think that you have a right, is that really the final question that needs to be asked as a Christian? Of course, Paul would say, no, that's not the final question. Turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. There's other passages we could look at concerning this principle, but I think this is a good one. Starting in verse 14, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubt is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now there's a lot in that passage, but essentially what Paul is saying is, the question of right is not the final and ultimate question within the kingdom. 
Just because you have a right to do something, he says, for in this example he's specifically talking about the eating of meat offered to idols, doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do it. Right? Because there's other concerns about the upbuilding of your brother and his faith and walking, as he would say, in love. And so personally, I abstain because I love my Christian friends who are recovering alcoholics. And I don't want them, I don't want to make it difficult for them. I abstain because I don't want to hurt my Christian influence because I don't want to discourage anyone's faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible's command to walk in love, I think, is a, at the heart of this belief. Abraham Lincoln supposedly once said, I say supposedly because whenever I'm quoting historical figures, I get a little bit nervous. Um, but Abraham Lincoln, and I think he did say this, but he said, alcohol has many defenders but no defense. Maybe you've heard that before. Many defenders but no defense. For some... Uh, maybe what we have discussed this evening uh, may be, and forgive the pun, but too hard to swallow, um, or hard to swallow. And it isn't an easy issue always to work through, especially in our society and in this area. But, but I'm convinced that abstaining from alcohol is the wisest choice for living a holy life to God. And hopefully we will prayerfully and patiently work together as we pursue peace and the unity of the Spirit. But, but maybe you're struggling with that this evening. Maybe um, you have a, a, a secret a struggle with this that no one really knows about and you want the strength and prayer of your brothers and sisters in Christ to help you through it. Or maybe you have some other need and you want to respond to the gospel. Whatever your need is, why don't you come as together we stand and as we sing.